Okay, so now we are set. So uh, as uh, Vivian said in the introduction, we are working with a fungus which traps nematodes, with, which is hunting nematodes. And uh, as she also told me that uh, it's a pretty diverse audience, let's say, I'm going to start with a short introduction because many of you may not remember what are fungi, or if you remember, uh, you, you probably remember you probably remember these fungi, uh, the ones on your pizza last night, or uh, the, the edible fungi, the mushrooms which you can eat. Some of you may also remember uh, things on these uh, fungi, uh, which you sometimes have in the refrigerator, um, and they are destroying your food, they are producing mycotoxins, and they are not very welcome. But uh, that shows you already that uh, fungi are in everywhere, and, uh, and they are very much involved in our daily life. And not only in a bad way, uh, but also in, in many positive ways. And I've just taken one example here. So if you have eaten uh, cornflakes this morning, uh, cereals, then uh, if, you, if you next time uh, you, you turn the package, I don't know why. Okay. If you turn the package, you see it is supplemented basically with a lot of different vitamins. And uh, for example, vitamin B2, that is riboflavin and riboflavin, is produced actually by fungus. So that is Ashpia gossipii. Um, and uh, you see the, the strategy. So the fungus is a little bit yellowish when it uh, grows on an agar plate. Um, and there are mutants uh, which were generated and they are completely yellow and they produce a lot of this riboflavin and it's uh, BASF actually who is uh, packaging it and selling it. And it produces uh, so much riboflavin in these big tanks that uh, the riboflavin even crystallizes in the in the liquid and then you just basically uh, uh, take it out of the liquid and you put it in bottles and you sell it and it's uh, added uh, to food and to feed uh, so all the food which is so nicely yellow that is usually uh, stained with vitamin b2 so we are seeing fungi every day we are eating fungi every day uh, they are really uh, uh, very important for our daily life and uh, the fungus we are working with, uh, that may be not as popular, but uh, for biologists is pretty popular because it's hunting nematodes. So it has a very different lifestyle than other fungi. And uh, you see the lifestyle here in this uh, animated uh, movie, which is actually not from our lab. Uh, so we just assembled the sequences from a longer movie. It produces those trap-like structures. And here you see already see elegans. And then... If you, if you look now how the traps are formed and how the nematode is caught, it's trapped. So you see that the nematode really looks for trouble. It actually really uh, goes into those traps. Here's another one. So once it's trapped, then you see that the hyphae, they penetrate uh, the nematode. They grow inside the nematode happily, and they colonize basically the whole body. And then they grow outside, and they, they go through the skin, and then uh, they grow into the soil again. So this is a very peculiar lifestyle. And uh, many biologists are fascinated about that, uh, including me. But um, it's not one of the model fungi, and then uh, it's, I thought always it's very difficult to work with. Um, but then after having uh, like 25 years or so of experience working with model fungi with Aspergillus nidulans and um, Altanaria alternata, I thought uh, it's about time to start something new. And uh, then in 2018, I started to work on this uh, interesting system. And the questions uh, we are having in the lab right now, they basically came all out uh, from, from this movie. So the first uh, question uh, we had is, uh, how can the nematode be so stupid and go into those traps? I mean, you've, you saw in the video that they really look for the traps and they are actively attracted. Uh, this is one question. The other question is, uh, so how does the fungus know uh, that there are nematodes? 
um, because it should only produce those traps if, um, if there are nematodes around and only if it's really necessary because uh, seeing the, the struggle here, those nematodes are quite big and uh, the traps are quite small. So it can also well happen that the nematode just rips apart the mycelium. So it should be all very well controlled. And uh, that's the fir first part of my talk um, about the, the attraction and the communication. And it's actually a, a ping. Uh, so the, the supervisor of the next uh, uh, student uh, who's going to talk, um, she discovered most of these uh, things here. Uh, so if you just grow the fungus on, on the agar plate, uh, it doesn't produce traps. So if you supplement it with glucose, it's happily growing and you, it doesn't need nematodes to, to survive. And this, um, uh, is regulated by a compound which is produced by the fungus uh, that's called atherosporol, and this inhibits basically trap formation. So it's self-inhibiting trap formation. And uh, the, the biosynthesis and also the, the molecule that has had been described before in, in two groups in China, uh, so they, this was all uh, quite well known. And then, as I said, one uh, prerequisite for trap formation is that uh, the fungus is starving, so we need a low nutrient medium. And then, uh, in addition, we need the nematodes. And uh, the fungus doesn't wait that the nematode just by accident comes by. Uh, it produces small volatile molecules to actually lure the nematodes into the colonies. And this methylbutanol, for example, um, and, and uh, some similar compounds, they smell actually like rotten apples. And rotten apples, uh, C. elegans likes rotten apples. Uh, so then uh, the, the uh, nematodes are attracted by this. And, and this was actually also discovered in Pink's lab uh, many years ago. So the, the nematodes, they smell this compound and then they are approaching the, the colony. Okay, so far so good. But now the, the colony also has to smell basically that there are nematodes around because otherwise it doesn't make sense to invest energy to produce the traps. And um, the, the recognition basically is again with a small molecule and that was again discovered uh, by Ping um, uh, some years ago. And those are the ascarocytes. And you probably know better than me what ascarocytes are. They are very important for C. elegans development. They control many, uh, many developmental processes. And uh, basically, uh, C. elegans cannot um, get rid of ascarocytes. It really needs it for, for its development. Uh, so those pheromones, they are smelled by the fungus. And that tells the fungus that there are nematodes around. And then uh, this causes uh, an, an inhibition of this uh, negative compound here. And then uh, we get the initiation of trap formation. So this is, is what was known basically. And then I had a, a, a new postdoc in the lab, um, uh, Shi Yu, and uh, she was working on secondary metabolism before. Uh, and she said, uh, why don't we study secondary metabolism in this new fungus in Arthrobotrys uh, flagrans? And then I said, okay, so she looked at, at uh, this pathway and uh, basically uh, all that works. So uh, she wanted to know how the atherosporol is synthesized in our fungus. Um, and uh, then uh, you have the putative pathway, you do the knockouts of the genes, and then uh, you see what are the intermediates and so on. And basically uh, to make a long story short, the biosynthesis was exactly like in, uh, um, in Atropotris oligospora. So it was already known uh, and shown uh, but then she wanted to know where those compounds are produced. Are they produced in the whole colony? Are they produced at the border of the colony? Are they produced in the traps? Um, so if you just do uh, uh, expression analysis using real-time PCR, then you basically have a mixture of all the mycelial stages. So we developed another uh, microscopic uh, assay, basically, where we fused the promoter of this gene, which is responsible for the atherosporal biosynthesis, we fused it to M cherry, and in, in addition, we added a nuclear localization signal. So we transformed it in, uh, in the fungus, and then uh, if the, the, pr the promoter is active, then the M cherry will be produced and it will localize in nuclei. So nuclei will be, uh, will be red. And that's very easy to see and very easy to distinguish from putative autofluorescence or so. 
Um, and then uh, she saw the expression of this RA gene, so the first one in the biosynthesis pathway. And we saw it uh, very high in the tip of the hypha, so the, the fungus grows from left to right. And we see that it's pretty highly expressed uh, at the tip of the hyphae, and in the back is a little bit less. When she took a second gene of the pathway, uh, the RB and the RC, so the second and the third gene of the pathway, uh, the expression pattern was different. So it was uh, like the RC here was not expressed in the tip, but it was expressed in the in the back. So that means that the RA is expressed uh, is expressed in the uh, the RA here is expressed in the tip, and the B and C and the A are expressed further in the back. So that means uh, the in the tip. Uh, we get the accumulation of this uh, compound here, and that cannot be converted to the atherosporol because the other enzymes are not there. So we have the accumulation of this molecule. And we thought maybe that is of any uh, significance. So what is this 6-methyl salicylic acid? And uh, if you go to the literature, you find that this molecule is very well known, actually from plant fungal interactions or from plant bacteria interactions. Uh, it's uh, very similar to salicylic acid. That's a, a hormone in plants, a plant hormone. And this is the methylated form, and it's used as a signaling molecule to tell the other plants that there are pathogens around. So it's a well-known signaling molecule, and we discovered this now uh, in, in this fungus. But although they are structurally identical, or we're not identical, no, similar. So uh, the methyl group is here, the methyl group is here. But the biosynthesis is very different. Uh, so this is derived from a polyketide, and this comes from uh, the aromatic amino acid biosynthesis. So it's very different biosynthesis, but uh, similar function. So um, because of this similarity, let's say, we speculated that this 6 MSA may also be involved in signaling. And we tested that by expressing the gene in a fungus, uh, which has nothing to do with nematodes, it's Aspergillus oryzae. Uh, so we express the, the protein there, and then that should produce the compound. And we place the fungus, which produces the compound on this side, and the wild-type strain on this side. We place C. elegans in the center, and then we look whether C. elegans would be attracted. And the result is shown here. And yes, it is in, attracted. So you see the uh, Aspergillus oryzae is not very attractive for C. elegans. Uh, but if you express this one gene, uh, this one protein in the fungus, then um, C. elegans suddenly likes it a lot. And then it, it goes uh, to, to this colony. Well, this is a, a pretty complicated uh, situation, let's say. And uh, that is summarized here. So as a take home message, uh, you can, um, you can, uh, uh, memorize that the, it's a complicated interaction in, uh, involving many small molecules for communication. So the fungus produces small compounds for uh, controlling trap formation. It produces small compounds to attract uh, C. elegans. Um, and C. elegans produce the ascarocytes, and they are uh, recognized by the fungus. And that causes the down regulation of the production of this, and then we get the trap formation. So you may ask, so why so complicated? Why there are so many compounds here involved and volatile compounds, and uh, why uh, the fungus could not just uh, uh, interact with a, with a nematode and respond to some surface molecules or so, and then initiate trap formation? Well, we have the, the idea, let's say, that this is a very a smart system actually to measure the density of the of the nematodes. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you imagine this situation, you have the fungal colony and there is a single nematode uh, swimming into the colony. It produces some ascarocytes, and then the fungus would um, would recognize it, or it would recognize some surface proteins, and then it would initiate trap formation in this place. But trap formation takes like five or six hours or or so. But during that time, of course. Uh, the uh, C. elegans is gone with the wind. So there, there will be a trap, but then there is no nematode around. So trap formation makes only sense if there are many nematodes. And those many nematodes, they produce a lot of ascarocytes. And that causes down regulation of the atherosporol uh, concentration in the whole colony. And then we have many traps. And then one of the nematodes will be, will be captured. So this is actually a, a pretty smart uh, idea of the fungus to monitor the number of nematodes. 
Okay, so the second uh, interesting phenomenon, uh, which, which we uh, uh, spotted in the movie basically, uh, is this one here. So you may have seen when the fungus uh, produces this trap, it grows 90 degree from the original hypha, it grows here, then it bends, and then it fuses here to the old hypha. And we notice that uh, before it fuses, uh, the other hypha already grows towards this hypha. So that means there is again a or there must be again a communication between the two hyphae that they recognize each other and that they prepare for the fusion. And uh, for, so this is the next aspect I'm going to discuss with you. Um, so we established uh, the cell biological tools to understand this morphogenesis here. So uh, here we have the microtubules stained and uh, the cell wall is stained. And then uh, we can nicely see how the cytoskeleton is arranged and we see how the tip here fuses with this uh, bottom hypha here. And um, there is actually a, um, a system known from Neurospora crassus or from a different fungus where uh, hyphal cells can communicate and can fuse with each other. And we tested whether this communication model also exists in this fungus and is important here for trap formation. And uh, this is actually one of the proteins which is labeled with GFP, which is known to be important in this communication process. And you see how they communicate. And communication means it's the recruitment of this protein to the cytoplasmic membrane. Now it's here, now it's here, now it's here, now it's here. So they are talking to each other. This hypha here is, is calling basically from the top here. Let's start again. So it's calling here, I'm coming, I'm coming. Then the other one shouts, yes, come, I, I'm ready with a coffee, so let's have a coffee. So they are coming and then they are fusing here. So there is this cell communication. But one open question was still, so how to start the conversation? I mean, here it's clear, okay, they are talking to each other. And uh, But if you think on your conversations, and I would do that now if I would be in the lecture hall, I would uh, start talking to you, to one of you. So then I use my, use my visual screen uh, or my, my visual sense uh, to spot some of you. Then I walk towards you and then I start the communication. So we somehow have to first know that there is a communication partner. And how is this uh, is happening here in... Uh, in this fungal system. So how can the fungus know there is another hypha waiting? Uh, so how is the communication initiated? And that actually we discovered uh, recently, and uh, this paper is uh, still in revision. We found that, that those hyphae, they are already uh, showing this protein oscillating at the tip, although there is no partner in the vicinity. So that means, and that has not been seen in Rospera so far. So that must be very, I mean, the signal is very weak. Um, so that's like a, a very low talking. So that means this fungus grows through the uh, through through the substrate and this is constantly talking. Is there somebody? Is there someone? Where, where can I talk to? And then if there is another one, that then it can respond. And um, then of course you, you have the problem that if I start talking to you and you start talking to me, uh, we have to coordinate the, the communication because uh, we should not talk at the same time. So if I'm talking, you should listen. And if you talk, I should listen. And uh, then uh, we, we could show, I mean, how, how these two uh, oscillations are basically coupled uh, that we come from this uh, monologue basically to a dialogue. And um, so now we can ask, so what happens if we interrupt the communication? So we can just delete one of the proteins. And that's shown here, the effect. So we deleted uh, this protein, which is localized at the membrane. And then you see the effect on the traps. Uh, this is the wild type trap uh, is closed. And then here, in the, if there is no communication, we get the initiation of the trap and the trap formation. But uh, the, the hypha cannot fuse, and uh, we don't get a functional uh, trap in the sense that it's a closed trap. This can still capture nematodes because the trapping principle is an adhesive glue, which is inside the hole here. Uh, so the nematodes still stick, but the, the morphology of the, of the trap is very different. Okay, so this, this was the part on the, on the communication. And now to the probably most um, interesting one. Uh, so the question, how does the, the fungus actually overcome the, the defense of the nematode, how can it kill the nematode? Uh, we have seen in the, in the uh, overview that the fungus is quite small in comparison to the, to the nematode. 
So how can we, how can, can a predator uh, kill the prey? And uh, there are different examples in nature. Uh, so it can be a very simple interaction uh, like in this one. Uh, but if we come to smaller animals, which catch bigger animals, then we need some more sophisticated ways. Uh, so um, like those snakes, they use poison and they paralyze the, the animal. And then uh, they are very, they, they have all the time uh, they need, and then they can eat uh, this. And the uh, question is, how do the fungi actually uh, overwhelm the nematodes? And uh, how, how can they uh, then eat the nematodes? And um, our, we had the hypothesis basically um, that it's, it's not a, a root killing, uh, but that is, is a killing with many small needles. And the small needles, they are actually the secreted proteins, which uh, we've mentioned in the introduction. Um, and those small proteins, they are well known in, in uh, other pathogenic interactions that they can uh, reprogram the host cell uh, for longer uh, interactions, for, for biotrophic uh, interactions, and so on. So uh, we had the hypothesis that there are perhaps small secreted proteins, so not just enzymes. Um, that was the, the view before that the fungus just secretes some lytic enzymes and lyses the nematode, and that's it. Uh, but we we speculate that there are small secreted proteins which play a role, for example, in, uh, at this stage, at the entry, uh, perhaps in later stages, uh, once the, nematode, the fungus is inside the nematode, and perhaps even later when it feeds on the, on the uh, sources of the nematode. And actually, when we analyzed uh, the genome of, of the fungus, uh, then we predicted that there are 262 small secreted proteins in this fungus. And if you take them and, and you, you analyze them uh, for other motifs, uh, you see that uh, some of them are even predicted to act in the nucleus or in mitochondria or at the plasma membrane. So that means um, we have this interaction between the fungus and the nematode. And then we hypothesize that there are these small secreted proteins that are secreted out of the fungus. And then they are taken up by the nematode cells. And if they have, for example, a nuclear localization signal, they would enter the nucleus and reprogram the nucleus. So that was our um, hypothesis. And we started analyzing them basically one by one. And uh, I'm going to show you the example of two. Uh, so this is the first one is the uh, nematode-induced protein A, NIP A. You see it's 133 amino acids. It's pretty small. It doesn't have any domains which would tell us uh, anything about the function. It has uh, a signal peptide, so it's secreted from the fungus. And it has uh, a number of, of cysteines here, which is, um, is quite typical for extracellular proteins because you can have disulfide bonds which stabilize the protein. And uh, so this, all this work now is, is unpublished. Um, so if we have these proteins, the first thing which we are testing is whether the predicted signal peptide is really functional. And we do that in, in such an, a bioassay, basically, which I'm not going to explain in detail. So if the colony is blue, that means the signal peptide is functional. So then it's, that was OK in this case. So it's really a secreted protein. Then what we do, we look whether it's induced when it's in the, uh, when it's, uh, in, in the presence of nematodes. Because we speculate that, uh, that those small secreted proteins, they are um, upregulated if there are nematodes around, because only then they would make sense. So in the first run, we do real-time PCR, and we see the, the gene is really upregulated. Uh, but then that could be upregulated in hyphae, could be upregulated in the traps. So the question is, where in the colony it's upregulated? And for that, we use the same um, a reporter essay that we fused the promoter uh, of the gene with M. cherry um, and then add a nuclear localization signal. Then we transform the fungus and then we check for fluorescence. And then uh, you see if we use a promoter which is expressed everywhere, so this is the histone promoter, uh, then we and fuse to GFP. Then you see that, that all the mycelium has green nuclei. If we now compare it to the to the to this small secreted protein to this effector uh, promoter uh, that is only active in the traps or very close to the traps, so that uh, works fine. Uh, so it's it's specifically induced by nematodes, and then we also looked for the protein, and uh, we saw that 
Uh, so this is the fusion of the whole gene with GFP. And then we see that it's found in vesicles. Those vesicles, they are motile and they are basically aligned here at the inner rim of the trap and they are waiting for the nematode that it enters. And once the nematode is there, then the vesicles, they accumulate here at the penetration site and they basically form a ring here um, where the fungus enters then the nematode. Question is, what is the function of this protein? Um, so it's secreted and it's probably ending up at the surface at the cuticle of the nematode. So what is the, the function there? And in order to, to do that, uh, we also have a routine uh, assay basically. Um, we take, the, we, we take now the fungus away. So we only take the nematode and we express this protein now heterologously in C. elegans. And then we look for a phenotype. So what happens if this fungal protein is expressed in C. elegans? And then we express it in different tissues. And uh, when we express it in the hypodermis, then we got this very peculiar phenotype, a, a so-called blister phenotype. So this is a blister like you get it when you are working in the garden. So your skin basically gets off and you have a liquid, a fill, a liquid filled chamber here. So this is the wild type tip here. You see that is uh, smooth and nice. And uh, this is the one which only expresses those uh, 115 or whatever amino acids of the fungus. Uh, so the idea is that this protein is secreted uh, here uh, from the hypha and then uh, basically uh, gets in contact with the cuticle and that causes the blister formation. And uh, now we are looking uh, with which uh, uh, proteins or components of the, of the hypodermis or of the cuticle it's interacting to cause this uh, blister formation. So the idea is that there are very little scratches perhaps or very little injuries where the small peptide can penetrate. And then once the blister is formed, then uh, of course uh, uh, this is much more fragile and then uh, other enzymes can enter and then the fungus can enter and can lyse uh, the nematode. So those blisters, they can be uh, characterized further. Um, so this is one is, is a nematode with uh, a very big or two very big blisters. Uh, it's only the vulva, which doesn't have a blister here. And then uh, this is actually the, the NIP-A protein fused to, to RFP or to M-cherry. And then uh, the blister is filled with liquid. Oops. Then, um, if we start, this is um, so if we now take this and we take a needle and we punch it, then you see that the liquid is coming out, and that tells you something about the nature of the blister, uh, whether it contains cellular components or not. And uh, so, we are studying this blister formation now in more detail. The second protein I wanted to mention is Sur A, and that has been published. If you want to read about it, um, we, uh, we we did this first, but uh, uh, now for telling the story, it's nicer to sh to show it as the second candidate. So it's again a similar size as the Nip A. It's again expressed in uh, in the traps, and uh, you can quantify that. And if we look for the protein here. Then uh, you see here that uh, this is the, the hypha here in reddish and uh, the greenish, this is the nematode. And then you see the fungus inside here is this one. And we see the nip A outside, actually. So that's the first protein for entry. And then the sur A is accumulating here at this bulbus inside the nematode. And uh, actually we showed that uh, we, we need this protein here to paralyze the nematode. So if the protein is not there, if we take a deletion strain, then it takes longer to be paralyzed. Again, this has, has only a pretty small effect, let's say, uh, but our hypothesis is that we need many small effects in order to overcome the nematode um, uh, and to, to eat it. Uh, so I think I could convince you that uh, it's not a hypothesis anymore, but that we have stage-specific um, small secreted proteins and that they help to, to penetrate uh, the nematode and to colonize the nematode. And in the last uh, two minutes, I'm going to show you uh, that the worm is not, well, on, on, the, on the first side is not so stupid, the worm, but on, on the second side, um, on, in, on the second view, uh, it seems that the, the fungus is even smarter and uh, uses actually the response of the nematode. So the question is, what does the worm do if it's attacked by the, by the fungus? So here you see the fungus, um, you see the nematode, 
the nuclear stained with GFP. And you see inside uh, the nematode, you see the hyphae with the nuclei of the fungus there in red. So this is an infected uh, nematode, uh, so to say. And the question is, uh, how is what is the response of the nematode? And nematodes actually are constantly exposed to microorganisms. They are eating bacteria. And uh, then they have, uh, for example, lysozyme to kill the bacteria. Uh, they are attacked by fungi. They have the cuticles, or you have to penetrate the cuticle. Um, and another uh, line of defense is actually uh, the production of neuropeptide-like proteins. So it's also small secreted proteins, uh, neuropeptide-like proteins, and uh, some of them have antimicrobial activity. So then the function is pretty clear. Okay, they can uh, kill the bacteria, for example. So those NLPs uh, are often produced if, uh, if we have a bacterial infection inside the intestine, and then the AMPs, they can uh, kill the bacteria. And uh, we looked, or Maria uh, actually looked um, for one specific one, uh, the neuropeptide-like protein uh, um, uh, 27, uh, that is expressed in the hypodermis, so that's the first contact with the fungus, um, and in, in, um, in two neurons. And uh, this is actually upregulated when the fungus is attacking the nematode. And we see it especially in the head region. So this is the control. This is the infected nematode. You see an upregulation here. You see the appearance in, in one neuron here. Uh, so it's, it's upregulated uh, if it's attacked. And the question is, for what is that good? Why is it upregulated? And what is the effect? And um, the, the peptide is quite interesting because it contains uh, this motif here, the YGGY or YGG, YGG. Um, and this, this uh, motif here uh, that is found in this tree peptide, uh, YGG, uh, is found in, in putative opioid peptides. Uh, so the hypothesis at the moment is that this uh, peptide is upregulated and then uh, the fungus has some sweet dreams while the, nemat uh, the fungus uh, is eating the nematode. So uh, this is a peptide uh, actually which is produced by the nematode, uh, but it's, it's very good for the fungus that it's produced because um, it helps to paralyze the nematode. And that is uh, shown uh, here. Oops, that is shown here. Uh, so here we have um, the uh, uh, paralysis time. You see the wild type um, and, and then the dying, you see the, the wild type uh, uh, is paralyzed in 150 minutes. And uh, if we have uh, deleted from C. elegans this peptide here, then we see that the paralysis is much longer. And we also found that uh, the NLP causes neurodegeneration. Uh, these are the PVD neurons of uh, C. elegans. Uh, so they are for mechanosensing. Uh, they are very nicely branched um, uh, neurons. And if we look during infection also, this is the nematode is infected here. And then we go from the infection side uh, towards the tail of the nematode. Then we see at the infection side, we have neurodegeneration. We don't have that comb -like, like structure. Um, and then the further we get away, then we get uh, back the, the neurons. So that means uh, the fungus upregulates this, uh, this peptide from C. elegans, and this peptide causes neurodegeneration and causes paralysis. So uh, basically, the, the fungus um, takes this function of the C. elegans peptide. So with that, I'm at the end of my talk, and um, I just wanted to summarize. Uh, I hope I could convince you that there are many signaling molecules which control trap initiation and uh, the whole interaction in this predatory um, um, interaction. Uh, I've shown you the Heifel fusion um, uh, project uh, where we know some signaling components, but we don't know the chemicals which are actually uh, used. Um, and I've shown you our evidence that there are small fungal proteins involved in the interactions, uh, that they act as virulence factors, and uh, that the fungus is so smart that it uses some small warm proteins also as virulence factors. And uh, I hope I could convince you that this predatory lifestyle requires physical contact, but also a lot of chemical interaction. And with that, I'm at the end. I mentioned the people already uh, during the talk. Uh, who were involved. Uh, these are the funding agencies and uh, 
If you're interested in the, in the web page or in more information, you can scan the QR code. Um, and uh, in addition to the nematode project, we have several other projects in the lab. Uh, so you can also find them on our web page. It's about light regulation in fungi and about secondary metabolite production in uh, Alternare Alternata. So with that, I'm at the end. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions.